Hey, um, good afternoon and welcome to our program, Swamp Forests, Great Apes, and Conservation Realities, Primate Research in Indonesia and the Republic of Congo with Catherine Meyer. Catherine is a doctoral candidate at Yale University, navigating the captivating world of conservation-focused research amidst the wilds of the Republic of Congo. In her talk, Catherine will share her experiences in tropical swamp forests across Borneo and the Congo Basin, exploring their biodiversity, cultures, and conservation challenges. Get ready for a glimpse into the life of a field primatologist and the captivating world of great apes and the local communities they coexist with. So please join me in welcoming Catherine Meyer. Hopefully I make this talk as exciting as that sounded. Um, <laughs> Okay, yeah, okay. So this is this is better? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, I, hello to everyone. Thanks for coming on a Thursday afternoon. Um, I used to give these presentations when I'd only gotten just out of doing field work in Indonesia, and I really loved being able to talk to public audiences and kind of share my experiences. And I haven't done that for a long time, since I'm now a sixth year PhD student, um, since I started my PhD. This is the first library talk I've given. So I'm sorry, I'm going to try and keep it as unacademic as possible and story-based. But if I get a little too academic for you, I apologize in advance. Um, but yeah, let's just jump right into it. Uh, so I'm here today to talk to you about primatology, primate fieldwork, and also tropical swamp forests, and also conservation. Um, I'm currently a PhD student at Yale University, and I study basically the effects of flooding and human presence on African great apes in the swamp. Um, at Yale, I'm in a very unique program, and by unique I mean I'm the only one currently in it. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a dual degree program between the Department of Anthropology, Biological Anthropology, and Yale School of the Environment. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I arrived at this particular point and also just describe to you what being a field primatologist is like, both in academia and in the field, and also tell you as many of the stories I've accumulated over the years of field work that I've done as I can squeeze in. Okay, this is how the talk is laid out, just a little intro to primates and primatology and then a very short personal history and academic trajectory which led me to Indonesia um, and then from Indonesia the research I did there led me to what I'm doing now for my PhD in Congo and finally some notes on conservation which is kind of the crux be all end all of for anyone doing wildlife and forest centric research these days. Okay. Um, I will also say that most of these photographs are mine, and I will try and make a note if I've used photographs that aren't my own. Um, primatology. What is it? Who does it? And why do we do it? Primatologists are individuals who study non-human primates, living non-human primates. Um, and so, as such, they are often people who are trained as ecologists or biologists. Um, I don't know if these people want to come in. Uh, ecologists and biologists, and they're interested in, in those exact things, the ecology and biology of this particular group of animals. Um, this is kind of a contentious uh, di division here because even though they might be primarily ecologists and biologists, often primatologists are housed in anthropology departments. And this is because no matter whether you're just studying the pure ecology of a primate, because primates are our closest living relatives, by studying them, you are inherently answering questions about human evolution. And so, for example, I, everyone I work with in the US are primatologists and anthropo biological anthropologists, that's what they're called. Um, and anthropology is a, a discipline with many subdivisions, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, so yeah, most primatologists in the US are based in anthropology departments. There's also a host of primatologists who are consider themselves psychologists, and these guys are typically focused on studying living uh, primates, and particularly great apes, since they're our closest living relatives, and looking at cognition and the way of their brains have evolved to tell us more about the way our brains function. Uh, those were not my pictures. These are a uh, famous primatologist psychologist, and Kanzi the bonobo, who was trained to uh, communicate with sign language and different ways of human communication. 
So we, you can ask me questions about that at the end of the talk. Um, very interesting. Okay, when I say primates, what am I talking about? Primates are a group or order of animals that include, firstly, lemurs, lorists, and tarsiers, generally. And these are kind of usually small-bodied primates. They're the ones that when you he people hear that they're primates, they're often surprised. They look more often rodent-like, or cat-like, or raccoon-like. Um, there's a ring-tailed lemur. Uh, so these are primates. And then we have monkeys. There's Monkeys are divided into two groups, Old World monkeys, so Asian and African monkeys, and New World monkeys, South American monkeys. And I'd say that monkeys are like the quintessential primate. When people hear primate, they think monkey. And you can see all monkeys have long tips. Mm -hmm. um, that distinguishes them from the last group of primates, which are the apes. Uh, apes are our closest living relatives, and they are going to be the subject of the rest of the talk, pretty much. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them. The group apes um, is subdivided between lesser apes, which are gibbons and siamangs. You'll see gibbons later in the presentation. And then we have the great apes. So this is a group that includes us. We are great apes. It also includes chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans. And within this group, there's a couple ways to kind of, we like to divide these, these groups up. One way is by separating, um, if we look genetically, the separation comes between these guys and orangutans. Is there some ways for me to point with a, um, a little, I should have thought of this before. Okay, yeah, I'll keep going. Um, so orangutans, the orange one on your left, are genetically the most dissimilar from the rest of us. We are more closely related to chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas, African apes, than orangutans. But since we like to think of ourselves as unique, we like to also group um, us apart from the rest of the non-human great apes, which are all large, arboreal dwelling animals, and obviously we are not. Um, and now, because I'll, the bulk of the next chunk of the presentation is about orangutans, I'm just going to tell you more about them. They stand out from the rest of the non-human great apes, aka the African great apes. That's because one, they don't live in Africa. They're the only Asian great ape. Um, they're also the most arboreal. Chimpanzees and gorillas and bonobos like to s travel and spend lots of time on the ground, uh, whereas orangutans pretty much spend their whole lives up in, high up in the canopies of their forests. They're also the most frugivorous. They eat the most fruit, um, which means that they need forests full of fruit to survive. And most interestingly, they are semi-solitary, which will come up a bit later. You'll see this in action. Chimpanzees and gorillas and bonobos live in live in huh. chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas. Sorry, chimpanzees gorillas and bonobos, yes, all live in relatively large, multi-individual, permanent or semi-permanent groups. Whereas orangutans are considered semi-solitary. Yes, they live together in a certain area, which you'll see, but they almost never socialize or remain in groups of multi-individuals at a time. They prefer to spend most of their lives alone. Obviously, there are exceptions to that, like mother-infant pairs um, and mating pairs, but for the most part, orangutans live solitarily. So this is very unique about them. Um, but why is it important to study them? Those things are just kind of unique factors that set them aside from the other great apes. They are highly forgivorous, like I said, which means that they are really important for the health of the forest ecosystems that they inhabit as seed, disper as seed dispersers. Um, and they're also critically endangered. Uh, most of the great apes are, most primates are which means uh, that they, by protecting them, we are also, they're, they're kind of a great conservation icon. They're critically endangered, their populations are dropping, and they can raise, they're very iconic, and we see ourselves in them, and so they, they rally a lot of support for conservation, which is also another thing we'll come back to in a bit. But the reason that they are so critically endangered, and more so than the other great apes, is that they have really slow life histories. This means that they reproduce 
exceptionally slowly. The only uh, longer re reproducing species is us humans. A mother orangutan can only have one infant every eight years on average. And so this means that when populations crash or decline, they cannot reproduce fast enough to get them back up if the, if the pressure is great enough. So they're, they're really, they're pretty endangered um, and things are not looking good for them. So just another reason to study them and to know more about their ecology so that we have better ways of protecting them um, and the forests ecosystems. This is just a, a mother with her Milo and her herd and she's eating termites off dead logs she picked up and her baby is testing out termites for the first time, he's grabbing some off the log, eating them. So this is why like mothers put so much in, um, effort into raising their offspring. It takes eight years for them to be fully mature, able to go off on their own and be in time in orangutans. Okay, <clears throat> stepping away from orangutans for a second, we're coming back to them. Um, who am I and why am I here? I grew up just next door in Madison, Connecticut. I went to Daniel Hand High School, and I'm from here. And I worked at Mystic Seaport for most of my young adult life and into college. I'm, I'm very much from here. But then I chose to go pretty much as far as I could away for college, which is to Minnesota and McAllister College, which is a really small liberal arts school in the Twin Cities. And when I went to college, I was considering being a studio art major. I was interested in a lot of things. I almost went to art school, and then I didn't. Um, I was interested in French, history, biology, like too many different things. And fortuitously, I wandered into an anthropology class in this very small anthropology department. And from there, I realized that anthropology is this perfect intersection of pretty much anything you could possibly want to study because it studies the variation in human cultural, social, and biological variation. <laughs> it's, it's everything to do with people. And so you can, you can be a, bio, a human biologist, you can be a primatologist, you can be a, a sociologist, like a, a histor uh, people who study history, history also plays into anthropology, archaeology, it's all kind of integrated into anthropology. And so I became an anthropology major, and as such I was required to study abroad, which I chose to do in Madagascar, because I wanted to use the French skills I already had. Madagascar is an ex-French colony, so they speak French primarily there. And it also has living primates. Um, so in college, I spent a long chunk of study abroad, carrying out this independent research study on a group of lemurs in northern Madagascar. And when I got back to college, I presented that research at a biological anthropology conference, where I met the woman, oh, that's my advisor from college, instrumental. He studied ancient hom hominid teeth, very niche. Um, at this conference, I met the woman who then employed me to do this research, I con continued for the next year after graduation in, in, in Indonesia. She was um, a primate ecologist who was running a long-term orangutan research project called the Tuan Orangutan Research Station in Kalimantan, Indonesia. So this was this is the epitome of a classic long-term primate research site, um, and it was also my first time in a peat swamp. But zooming out just to situate ourselves, Indonesia is this group of islands in between Australia and mainland Southeast Asia. Um, and orangutans are only found in the wild on the islands of Borneo and Sumatra. So very small geographic range to begin with. And here you can see their distribution in orange, very fragmented and sparse. These are the only places that orangutans exist in the wild. Um, and I was working right there in South Central Kalimantan, which is Indonesian Borneo. Borneo, as an aside, is a weird country, as a weird um, island. It's the third large, largest island in the world, and it's actually divided between three different countries. So the bottom half is Indonesia, the upper half is Malaysia, and there's a third country, a tiny country called Brunei, in the northern tip of it. Very interesting place. But I was working in the Indonesian part, right down there. And like I said, this was a peat swamp forest. And when I first decided, said yes to going here, I wasn't really sure what I was getting myself into. When people hear, when I heard the word swamp forest, this is what I thought of. Um, the fire swamps from The Princess Bride. Uh, it wasn't a very appealing thought. And I think a lot of people, when they hear the word swamp, have immediate negative connotations.
bad. <laughs> no, I'm not saying I like to go to summer home here, but the trees are actually quite lovely. What I found when I got there was that it was not at all like the fire swamps of Princess Bride. It was, and the trees were in fact lovely. <laughs> um, but these tropical peatland forests are very unique e ecosystems. Peatlands exist in both the northern and the southern hemisphere, and, and I'm only going to talk today about tropical peat swamp forests. Um, so in the tropics, these are wetland forests, so they're rainforests, rainforests that are also wetlands, which means that the soils are waterlogged, which creates anoxic conditions, so there's no oxygen, and thus organic matter that falls from trees or other organic material in the forest doesn't decompose because there's no oxygen, and it slowly builds up layer after layer over thousands of years to create these thick layers of peat. Um, so these are very unique and ancient ecosystems. They have key differences from normal tropical forests, such as because of the waterlogged soils, um, the trees are usually thinner, smaller, since the soils can't support the huge root structures that you see in big tropical, when you think big tropical forest trees. Um, and they're also really wet. Importantly, these ecosystems and wetlands in general are, cons are often considered refuge habitats for both humans and wildlife that are marginalized or exist in other forest ecosystems that are then degraded. Um, and then those, those individuals or those populations get pushed into these more marginal, less, high, less um, val valued forests or other weapons. What does it look like to get to these kinds of research stations? Often they're in really remote areas because ecologists, when they're studying the ecology of a, species, of a particular species, they want to be usually as far removed from anthropogenic influences as possible so that they are na they're studying natural conditions. So the, to get to this research station, Tuanan, it was a long drive out of the capital of Kalimantan and then an equally long boat ride down this large river system which feeds the peatlands uh, to a little village at the edge of the forest. And from that village, we would take about a half hour walk along a little path that led right to the edge of this chunk of very remote forest. And you can see that dot, dot right there is this research station. This is the Tuanan Orangutan Research Station, and most long-term study sites are something equivalent of just a very small, um, primitive structure where researchers live and work out of. So I spent a year after graduation living in this structure. Um, every day I'd go into the forest to do my research. Usually we would stay here about two to three months and then spend a week back in the capital sending data out and having some much needed break from the swamp. Um, and so yeah, these, these, these are little tiny research ecosystems, um, permanent ecosystems. This map shows you basically what the forest itself, the study area looks like. All of our research is conducted within this sis grid system of trails that are cut into the forest. So this is how um, the research camp is right over here, and every day we'd follow the main trail to wherever we knew uh, the orangutan we wanted to study was, and continue to follow him wherever he went throughout the day, uh, and mark where he ended, and then do it all again for usually about a week until you get a break. Um, more on that soon to come. But it, we should note here that one, one aspect of these long-term research stations is that the animals we're studying are habituated. So this means that researchers identified a population of animals that they say, okay, we want to study here, and then they proceed to follow, for at least for primates, this is pretty standard, you follow those individuals of the group you want to study as often as you can until they seem to have no obvious reaction to your presence, which is pretty hard to do, um, especially for really smart and wary animals like great apes. So these guys, every orangutan that existed permit, mostly permanently in the study area was habituated since this project's been going on since the early 2000s, so um, they are really used to researchers following them around every day, watching what they're doing. And this is the only way we can get behavioral data from primates, is to follow them and record everything they're doing by watching. So there's no remote way of doing it. It's pretty resource and labor intensive. They're also the largest arboreal mammal in the world. You can see this guy, he's an adult male. They can weigh up to 250 pounds. 
or even 300 in captivity, so they're huge. Um, okay, how do we study orangutans? Uh, we do what are called focal follows, and this means that every day a number, a number of individual orangutans are being followed, and we go out, us researchers, we go out, go out into the forest every morning to find our focal individual. And then once we watch them all day, record everything that they do throughout the day, and usually, like I said, we follow the same individual for multiple days in a row, or at least we try, so that we get consecutive days and a long-term picture of that individual's behavior or health in that given period. Um, oh. oh, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, great apes, all great apes build nests every single night. This is one young male building himself a, a nest for the night, and you can see him. He's got this nice branch kind of swayed over, and now he's going to be breaking more branches into it to create a nice puffy platform of leaves for him to sleep on. He'll lay down into it. They do this every night. Every individual of every grade of species builds nests. And this is the way that we do follows. Um, this is the way we keep track of multiple individuals for multi-day periods. And it's actually, orangutans are one of the only individuals we can do this with because um, they're slow and there's no elephants or anything in the forest that we would have to be afraid of at night. So what happens is, because they build these nests, the way we follow them are called nest-to-nest -nest follows, which means we wake up every morning at 3 a.m. Yep. I don't know how I ever did that. These days, 8 is feeling like pushing it. Um, 3 a.m., get ready and get into the forest by 4, so that we can get to the orangutan we want to follow's nest, which has been marked the night before, before he wakes up, he or she wakes up. Um, it can be a five-minute walk away from camp, it can be an hour walk away from camp. It can be the wet season or the dry season, so it can take hours to get there in the morning. But you want to wake, you want to get there before, before the individual wakes up, um, so that you know where they are and you can follow them for the rest of the day. And you do, and then you just do that. You follow them for the rest of the day until they build their nest at night, and then you mark where that is. You go back to the research station, process all your data, and do that again and again and again and again and again. Um, one of the key things to do once we got to the orangutan's nest was prepare to collect biological samples. Most of the data we're collecting at these sites is behavioral, so just directly watching the individual and saying, what are they doing? But that is complemented, really importantly complemented by biological samples, both fecal and urine samples that are sent to labs and then analyzed for things that like hormones. You can tell if an individual is pregnant, you can look at parasite loads, you can look at other, all sorts of health proxies that then you correlate to behavior. You're saying, oh, I saw that this individual was acting strangely on these dates, and then you look at the samples from that, the, that date set and you say, oh, I see that it was, she was pregnant, that's probably why or if she had, you know, giardia or something. Um, how, collecting fecal samples from orangutan is pretty straightforward. You find the poop, you scoop it into a vial, and you close the vial. Collecting urine samples is a little more complicated, and it required getting to the nest early enough so that you could find yourself a nice, long sapling with a fork at the end, open a little, uh, cut open a little plastic baggie, attach it to the end of that fork, and then wait in the darkness to listen for the rustle of the orangutan getting out of its nest. And once you heard that rustle, you'd have to shoot out, hold the stick out, kind of in the dark still, because they wake up at like 4.30 or 5, and wait to hear the sound of urine falling through the leaves, and hope that you had positioned yourself well enough to not get peed on. It's quite a feat. I'm, again, another thing, I'm not quite sure how I ever successfully did that. Um, and it was pretty rare to get enough into the bag where you could collect a good sample, but here is one of the um, research assistants holding up a collected sample from a successful nest uh, urine collection. Once all of that is out of the way, we proceed with the day of following these semi-solitary individuals. So, now on to this behavioral data I've been talking about. We're taking two minute interval behavioral data samples for the whole day from nest to nest. So that's about 12 to 14 hours taking a data point every two minutes um, of what that individual is doing. 
or what any individual around them is doing. And this is a pretty standard day. The rhyme pens up high, moving slowly, looking for food. We're on the ground, just watching it. Um, so this is what that data sheet looks like. You can you see, zoom in. Those are two minute intervals right there, on the time right there. This orangutan woke up at 5.26 a.m. and proceeded to rest and then move, 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 every two minutes, so this is not a long time. And then finally he found some fruit and he's feeding. We're marking what kind of fruit it is, what the maturity of the fruit is, what part of the fruit they're eating, how high up in the canopy they are, if there are other orangutans near him, in this case there was another un like young male near him, how far away they are, what's happening between the two, are they looking at each other, are they vocalizing, and also weather, like um, cloudy, this means cloudy. Um, there's just, uh, just every two minutes, it's just like this host of all these different variables. But, like I told you, orangutans are semi-solitary, they move slowly, they're usually alone, it's rare to find more than a couple individuals together at a time. And just to contrast this, I wanted to show you this video from my advisor who studies the largest known chimpanzee population in the world, in Uganda. Chimpanzees are loud, aggressive, they live in huge fission fusion societies where they live in a big group and then different smaller groups break off of consorting individuals. There's males and females together, they're always in social interaction. So I literally cannot imagine what it's like to take data on a vocal individual in this kind of situation after spending so long with these nicely solitary and usually um, very calm orangutans. Uh, yeah. Orangutans, being great apes and very closely related to us, <laughs> do not only spend most of their day do not only spend their day just looking for food. They also have complex behaviors, including building nests and other kinds of constructive tool-using behaviors, um, such as this guy who is ingenu ingeniously creating himself a nice little rain hat during a sudden storm. Um, and you'll see him peeking out at the rain under it in a second. It's pretty cute. Even in captivity, they have this drive to put things on their heads and make nests out of whatever's in their enclosures. It's, it's very much ingrained in, in their genetics to construct things. Yep, so he's just hiding from the rain. But yes, most of the day is spent watching them move between feeding trees. Um, looking at what an animal is eating, where it's eating, when it's eating, what, food, uh, what is available for it to eat in its habitat is kind of the crux of any kind of ecological study. This is like, if we don't know what resources and energy are available to an individual, we won't be able to manage them in captivity, we won't be able to then protect the species of plants that are important for it in its forest, etc., etc. And also if there's any major changes or shifts, like from climate change and all of a sudden the forest doesn't produce fruit, and we don't have that baseline data, we have no, no way to interpret it or kind of manage the consequences. So this, the, re, the woman who I hired me to do this research, she was technically a dietary ecologist. She, her main focus is looking at resource available, availability and nutrients, nutrient balancing by orangutans. So we looked at a lot of what they ate. Um, by the end of the year I was there, I could recognize I could identify what fruit an orangutan was eating just by hearing the sound it made of, of, him, of it, chew, it being chewed. So it was, it's, we were really focused on fruit. This is a fruit called a karkunin, which just means yellow vine in Indonesian. And here's a big male eating that same fruit. And here is a female eating that fruit, being watched by a male. This is pretty much as exciting as orangutan social interactions get. <laughs> she is over there, munching away on this very cool and not tasty fruit. I did try it. Um, and then this big male is following her around. He's been following her around for days. He's not really made any moves. He's just over there watching from a distance. <laughs> so you can see that they really are closely related to us. <laughs> um, the end of this video just shows how, how far away we are relative to them, so I'll let it play out. Um, 
Yep, this is this is this is intense stuff for running times. So you've now seen what it was like to do research at one of these classic long-term field sites. And these two sites are really important. They're they're very resource intensive. Like there's only a handful of them for each any given species, and only they usually only exist for iconic species. So like chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans, sure, there's a handful for each of those those groups. But le less iconic primates, less iconic species, usually don't have long-term study uh, investment because it takes so much money and, and infrastructure and human uh, energy to keep them going. But they are really valuable when they are maintained because we have this, they give us this amazing long-term high quality data on the biology and ecology of whatever species we're interested in studying. Um, they also, by having this permanent presence of researchers in a forest area, we protect that area and the whole, not just the animal we're studying, but also the whole forest biome. And for a forest like where I was working, that peat swamps are notoriously biodiverse and have a lot of endemic species, so species that don't exist in other kinds of habitats. For example, where I was working in Chuanan, there were not just uh, orangutans, there were other primates, including some nice monkeys that are also endangered. Um, these are the other apes ape group, the lesser apes, gibbons, and I just want to show you them because they're amazing, and you heard them in all the videos, so here you can see one. Notice he doesn't have a tail. That's how you identify and separate monkeys from apes. Apes don't have tails, we don't have tails. He's not a monkey. Um, but then, like I said, all these other animals that live in the forest that would never get any kind of research attention like orangutans do, or funding for that matter. A lot of reptiles, a lot of birds, that's for you, Kristoff. <laughs> um, we have a resident bird expert in the room. Uh, and, and even more importantly, e insects, which no one ever thinks about. In fact, they are the bane of most researchers' existences, but they are equally important to the function of the ecosystem as orangutans, one could argue. So, um, these permanent research sites protect that air, whatever area of forest they're focused on from other kinds of exploitative activities and they create local employment because like I said these require long-term human presence to keep the data collection going so while we external Western researchers might cycle through we are there for a month or a year carrying out a specific project we always come back to the West um, all the PIs are located at Western universities which means that it's a bunch of um, local Indonesian men who've been trained in data collection methods who are there permanently. Every day they're in the forest collecting data in, in or with or without the presence of external researchers driving anything. So most of the people I worked with at the station had previously been illegal loggers. Um, and this research project provided them with a adequate alternative livelihood to, to, to get out of that industry and, and start doing this. Um, so very important. But as I was doing all of this ecology, I loved the work amazingly. Yeah, I loved the peat swamp. I loved the orangutans. And, but I spent a lot of my time, my off time in the local village with all the people, um, the families of the assistants, etc. And I just felt like the research kind of was missing something and I was really wondering how the culture um, and politics of people being in and around these forests, including us, not just local people, was impacting the ecology, the ecological interactions we were studying. Oh, yeah, that just says the exact same thing. Which has led me to where I am today, doing a very long PhD um, in the Republic of Congo. The Republic, of, uh, the Republic of Congo, I should note, is not Democratic Republic of Congo. DRC is the notoriously politically unstable, dangerous, um, crazy place that everyone thinks I go to. Republic of Congo is just next to DRC. Just next to DRC. This most of Central Africa is DRC. I work in Republic of Congo to its west, up in the very northern corner at this place right here. Um, and Republic of Congo is a French colony, so they speak primarily, their language is French, but also they have a lot of 
um, Central African and local languages as well. Um, so French-speaking, ex-French colony, uh, much more politically stable and smaller, but still a big part of the Congo Basin rainforests. The place I now work in is not just a random chunk of forest, it is a, it is a designated protected area. So all of these green blobs you see here in Central Africa are um, identified protected areas. And when I say protected areas, you all know many what many protected areas. National parks are like the quintessential protected area. Yellowstone is just a protected area. But there's a lot of other kinds of protection. Um, and some of those some of those are not national parks. Some of them are different kinds of reserves, um, which typically means national parks are strictly off limits to human use, whereas with any kind of reserve implies some level of human like sustainable resource use involved in the in the landscape management. I work at a place called the Lock Tele Community Reserve. Like I said, it's this little blob here. It's a just overlaid on a what is a larger um, the largest wet tropical the largest wetland forest in the world, which is part of the Congo Basin, Congo River um, fluvial deposit. That doesn't make sense, but um, it's part of the Congo River's wetland uh, basin, and so yeah, it's um, a, it's a strictly protect, or it's a community reserve. So it's a protected area, but that also has communities within it, and this is going to be kind of the key thing moving forward that I'm talking about. Most of those protected areas that you saw are either managed or co-managed by one of the world's big conservation NGOs. So you've probably heard of WWF. WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society. There's a bunch of other ones. There's the Nature um, TNC, the Nature, Cons the Nature Conservancy. That's a big one. Uh, there's so many acronyms. Um, but yeah, most people have heard of these. If you're into conservation, you might even get emails from them. And they often look like this. Uh, these big organizations are neoliberal, capitalistic, uh, fund-driven uh, entities uh, that are that usually focus on areas with iconic wildlife to really get public support for conservation and public funding for, for conservation in order to do the things that they do. So the site I work at now is a protected area, it's a community reserve, and it's managed with the Congolese government and the Wildlife Conservation Society together. Um, so I rely entirely on this NGO to get me to and from Congo and to the field site because it's a pretty remote place and otherwise I just there would not be the infrastructure logistics to be for me myself alone to do it. I don't work with other Yale people for this PhD. It's designed was designed totally by myself um, because of the qualities of this particular area where I now work. I really wanted to work here. It fit everything I was looking for. So now I've moved I for this PhD I moved on from orangutans to African graves. Specifically, this site is known for having one of the highest densities of lowland, western lowland gorillas in the world. Now these guys, these are western lowland gorillas. Most people here know the difference between a chimpanzee and a gorilla. They can, they've heard of gorillas, they've heard of chimpanzees. Often, they've only heard of mountain gorillas, um, which are the longer, better studied cousins of these guys. Uh, these are lowland gorillas, and they live more in central and west Africa, in the Congo Basin rainforests and often they share the same forests as chimpanzees. So both chimpanzees and gorillas are living in the same habitat. Um, but like I said, where I work, there are no habituated, there's no primate research ongoing at this site. There's no habituated ape populations. There's no, there's no, there's no one doing long-term research of any kind there. There's just the NGO that has its basic management um, activities, which I'll describe a little bit later. So why is this, high priority landscape full of these critically endangered great apes so unsaid. Why do we have so little data about it? Um, it doesn't even have just this high density of gorillas. This is kind of the conservation focal point of the area, but it's also got a ton of other big iconic species, including chimpanzees, so two apes, two great apes. It's got elephants, forest buffalo, all these other, just not as in as high densities as the gorillas. So different ape, different swamp forest, 
This is still a peat swamp. It was actually only discovered to be a peat forest in 2017. Until then, we just knew it was a big wetland um, forest, but it is peatland. However, it's really different. It's, it's considered a seasonally flooded forest. Um, and what that means is that instead of in Indonesia where there was always kind of, it was always really swampy, there was a rainy season and a dry season and it got wetter and drier, but it was always at some level pretty homogeneous, the same level of wet and swampy and mucky. Didn't change much. This place, on the other hand, is seasonally flooded swamp, but it's got a whole host of different kinds of habitats, forest habitats within it. So there is a big chunk, there's pockets and a big chunk of what dry forest, not swamp at all. There's raffia swamp, which is a palm dominated, very wet type of muddy swamp. There's hardwood swamp. You'll see all of these in action. Um, and then there's seasonally flooded forest. So kind of like dry forest, but it floods completely once a year. So really diverse kinds of habitats. But the, the reserve area itself, when we talk about it, we say it's a seasonally flooded forest. And all of these dots along here represent forest dependent communities, human communities. There's 27 that live within the bounds of this protected area. And so not only is it swamp forest full of apes, but there's also people pretty much central, centrally located and using pretty much every part of this forest ecosystem. And they've been here for generations. There's really few protected areas in the world where usually if there are community, local communities adjacent to a protected area, they're adjacent, they're at the periphery, they have zones where they can use resources, but then there's still a core protected area. This is not like that at all. These people are literally the center of this whole, uh, they live along this river system that bisects the reserve, and they are central to the whole system, which is why it was named a community reserve. And it remains Congo's only community reserve. There's no other places like this. So, I found the study system, I said, wow, another swamp, more apes, and people. So a really important conservation context. And there's been almost no research done here, so maybe I can do some kind of baseline monitoring. Um, and that's how my PhD project evolved. Um, that's what I'm doing now. And what I was really interested in is how all these different things connect. So how does... How do gorillas that live in such high densities here coexist with other animals that probably use the same resources like fruit, such as elephants and chimpanzees, alongside also forest-dependent people who have hunted them for generations and also rely on wild meat for protein? And how does all of this kind of happen amidst a landscape that floods seasonally? So my research has become much more interdisciplinary, which was the whole reason I went to this dual degree program at Yale, to be able to do this kind of very half and half project. Half of my work is in the forest, and half of my work is in villages. Um, I'm going to go through what these mean very vaguely, so we're not going to get into the nitpicky of it unless you want to ask me about it later. Um, the objectives of both these kinds of research, both in the ecology and the ethnography, is one, to, basic, to provide the baseline data ecological and social that we need to be able to say this is how we can better protect apes into the future on this landscape and also to do that in a way that's respectful to the fact that over 20,000 people have been living in this and around this forest for generations and have already a pretty deep knowledge of the things we're asking ourselves. I developed this project myself. I went to Congo for the first time alone. I worked with the NGO to arrange the logistics, but for this year of field work that I just completed in August, I created myself a nice little team um, so that I was not alone. And that consists of a lot of people, a lot of the staff at the NGO, but specifically these three individuals. This is Tyriel. She's a PhD student in the Republic of Congo, um, working also in a dual degree between forestry and anthropology. Joseph's a PhD student from DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, and he's a botanist, um, focusing on the, for the plants of the peatlands of Congos. And Bola is the long-term ecologist for the NGO. Uh, he's, been, he's from the reserve. He's been working with the NGO as their lead ecologist for over 20, 25 years. 
So between the three of us, we carried out a year of research that was this half ecological, half ethnographical. So hopefully this is mostly story-based, um, not too much nitpicky about the, the project. Uh, the forest, very different from Republic of Congo. The main part of the forest part of this study is the implementation of a phenology study. So phenology is the monitoring of reproductive phases of anything, but specifically in this case trees. So we're look, we um, identified trees, species that were important, that we knew were important, fruiting trees for gorillas, chimpanzees, and elephants, and we tagged over 800 of them in, in four different types of forest. Um, and then we have, I trained teams of local guys in data collection methods where they're going out every month and looking at those 800 trees and collecting the same data every month. How many flowers are there? How many new leaves are there? How, many, how much fruit? Every month, and so that we'll have a year-long picture of when and where fruit is available to all of these species. It's pretty, um, pretty hard work. Uh, but more excitingly, what is it like to be in these forests? You saw what the Indonesian forests are like. These are really different. Um, and there's so many different kinds of forests that it really changes depending on where I was. So, Swamp forests. Um, we in in this situation, I don't uh, have a research station to go back to every night. So whenever I go into the forest, it's for at least a week. We carry everything we need on our backs, um, and we camp along the way as we go deeper and deeper into the forests. So a lot of camping, a lot of hammocks to avoid tents on sodden swampy ground, um, and. This is kind of what a, some of the seasonally flooded forest looks like to, to go through. This is a pretty flooded moment. Um, it does get drier, but yeah, there's a lot of, these forests are amazing. They are also very challenging to work with, which is one of the reasons that very few people have worked in them. Uh, lose a lot of toenails, destroy a lot of rubber boots. One of the big biggest problems I'd say working in the, the, the really wet parts of the swamp are elephant footprints because you're walking along and you're avoiding all these tree roots and you're doing a great job but then and you're kind of tentatively stepping and with each step there's mud so you sink a little bit but every few steps you sink down to your waist because you've stepped in an elephant footprint that was just you couldn't see because of the water so they are out there there's a lot of them we just never see them um, what I eat during field work is usually one of the top questions on everyone's list. So when I'm in the forest, breakfast is typically consists of canned and dry goods. We bring in a lot of spaghetti and rice and canned meats, which um, unsurprisingly are usually coming from China. This is canned pork from China. And we cook that up as fast as we can to get out into the forest as fast as we can before all the things that could happen like bee swarming, which I'll talk about in a second, start to happen. So we, we, we make fast food, and we get out into the forest and start on our, on our work. Um, for dinner, dinner is a little different because we finish the day of work. We have to take a big chunk of time to make a camp for the night, get a fire going before it gets dark. And often during the day, we've seen or collected other kinds of food resources that are not just canned pork and spaghetti. So this is a big type of forest fish that lives in the swamps in the forest. Um, it's known for having jaws strong enough to crack open raffia seeds, which are like these huge hard seeds. And you, he was just showing how it was like chomping a machete. If I had the sound on, you could hear it literally going on the machete. Um, and they're delicious. <laughs> but people hate them because they think they look like dragons. But they still like to eat them. Um, there is a whole season at Loch Tele where Caterpillars fall from the sky, and they become one of the major sources of protein available to people in those moments. So those are some of the caterpillars we collected in the dry forest, and those little things are smoked caterpillars amidst the stew of uh, this wild leaf called cocoa, and the quintessential starch that everyone eats, which is fermented cassava bread. Um, it's hard to describe. If you want to know more about it, I can tell you about it later. Or, you know, other things like wild mushrooms we often come across. And, and the people I work with, I always go in with a team of people from the local village. Um, and they always know what's edible and what's not, thankfully for me. 
bees are both the joy and the bane of our existences. There are bees everywhere in this forest, um, and they are particularly rampant when there's it's the flowering season, so that changes depending on where you are in the forest. Uh, so at any given moment, there could be swarms of bees, and they usually swarm right at the um, beginning of the day. So right as it's getting light, if you're near a, bee, a beehive, and you've set up camp near a beehive, you'll know it. Um, and there's been times where we had to just abandon camp, like not even get dressed because you couldn't put clothes on because there were so many bees on the clothes and on your back or your backpack and, and just run out of camp and run fast enough so that you lose all the bees, quickly put everything together and start on your day. Um, but there's an upside to these bees. <laughs> they produce honey. <laughs> uh, this forest, this swamp forest produces some, the most honey of any forest system in Congo. Most of the honey that we find, I find in Brazzaville, the capital, or anywhere else in the country, is exported from these swamp forests. Um, and so there are days when we find a beehive that's close enough to the ground that we can access it. And that day, there is no canned pork. There's only honey. And it's a great day. Great days. And it turns out, um, un maybe unsurprisingly to anyone who knows ape ecology, that chimpanzees also love the honey. So. Often when I'm talking to hunters about chimpanzee ecology, the times they've run into chimpanzees is when they've both been trying to go for a honey, a beehive, and get the honey out of it. And this right here, you saw this hole, that's our machete hole to get into a beehive. This is um, a hole made by chimpanzees and any hunter, when I ask them about tool use, quintessential in, in chimpanzees, the first thing they note is that they've seen chimpanzees take huge logs and bang open honey holes in order to access honey. So this is a pretty cool tool, which means they have to basically hang up high in the tree, grab a log, and just bat open a tree hole, um, and then extract the honey. And so honey is kind of a contested resource for humans and chimpanzees, and it's everywhere in this forest. I've never gone into the forest and not found honey. One of the most beloved, and for me, not beloved stories of forest work in this place was the time we were cutting our way deep into a swamp, a raffia swamp area, which is really wet and dense, and we're just cutting through to get to a certain GPS point we've marked. And so you're walking into pools of water that are kind of obscuring tree roots, and I'm with a bunch of guys from the village. This guy was in the lead, and all of a sudden, he whips out his machete, and just, it looked like he was whacking his own leg. And it turned out a huge python, that python, in fact not that huge, um, had just come out of the water and latched itself onto his leg and immediately started wrapping itself around. He didn't scream, I would have screamed. Um, he very nonchalantly took out his machete, whacked it on the head without hitting himself, and effectively ended up killing it. Um, and he said this is the fifth time that's happened to him. He couldn't feel his leg for five minutes afterwards because of the impact of the, of the bite. But he was really nonchalant about it, and we ended up then eating it Oops. that night for dinner. It was not good. <laughs> this is um, the group of men from four of the 27 villages that I've trained now in data collection met methods for the phenology monitoring. Sorry, we're back to research for a second. Um, and they, so they are, most of these people are illiterate. They're now, these guys are now able to collect the monthly data, and they're doing so as we speak. Um, like I said, most of what they're looking at is fruit, where it is, when it is, who's eating it. And they're also collecting biological samples, fecal samples from those three species that we're interested in with the hopes that they can then be used for genetic analysis that will tell us what each animal is eating without me actually watching them, since I can't. Um, so this is just one non-invasive way to take that same kind of dietary ecology approach to understanding species uh, diets and existence in a particular habitat. I'm not going to go into that. Um, so onto the other half of this whole project is based in villages. It's all ethnographic. Ethnographic work is what anthropo like cultural anthropologists do. It's the crux of anthropology. And the goal of it is to go embed yourself in a, the culture you want to understand for long periods of time where the main methodology is doing interviews and talking to people 
but it also involves what's called participant observation. So you're really just living the same way everyone else is living and trying to understand what that's like for as long as you possibly can. So I do that with Tyriel in these villages. Um, the villages are pretty rural, like there's no electricity, all access to these villages is by boat once you enter the reserve. Um, they don't have cell service, I don't, there's no running water, everyone, um, I'm, it's, it's as remote as pretty much any place in the world that it still exists could be. Um, most people live in these mud houses that have raffia thatched roofs. Um, everything that they make is pretty much made out of materials from the forest. And they're pretty much completely dependent nutrient-wise on forest resources. So when I'm there, I eat everything that they eat, and I've pretty much eaten everything that lives in that forest except primates. I think I've eaten a monkey once, but no one told me directly it was a monkey. Um, and I also do the day-to-day -day activities that everyone does. I go with them, women to their fields where they grow agriculture, uh, manioc, cassava, that's their main staple crop. Um, I, this is a man who's been harvesting palm sap to make palm wine, which is a quite an interesting process that I can't explain right now. And all of this social, cultural research is showing me a lot, showing us a lot of things that haven't really been talked about um, from other research that's been done in the area. When, when conservationists and managers talk about the reserve, they talk about it as a homogenous entity, so a seasonally flooded forest. We know that's not true, it's very heterogeneous. They also talk about the people as being pretty much ethnically homogenous, this all the same, which they call them the Bomitaba, that's the name of the dominant ethnic group. But all of this in-depth social research is showing me that the cultural and social diversity is enormous, um, and it's also highly related to the flood pulse of the whole ecosystem. So where it flood, everything comes back to flooding. Where and when it floods determines what the forest ecosystem is in that in one particular area, and what the forest ecosystem is and how it how much it changes from place to place also determines what resources people have available to them to use, what animals are next to them, what animals have they lived next to for generations. So there's all these there's so much diversity and it all tracks with these patterns of seasonal flooding. Um, one of the good things about living in a swamp forest is that there's only so much these people can do development-wise to destroy their forests. Um, there's, there's not much you can do. Uh, most people don't even hunt that much because most of their protein comes from fish, and they prefer it that way. But almost every household does supplement uh, food nutrients from wild meats. Um, Yep, I'm going to skip through that. So uh, we're learning a lot from stories about the kinds of things chimpanzees and gorillas do. I talked a little bit about that already. All of these systems are kind of collapsing. Uh, with the in, uh, increase in market access and just the disintegration of traditional power structures, all this local, this ancient knowledge that the older people in the villages hold is being lost. And the younger generations aren't really, don't really care about keeping up with it because they're just trying to survive. They're just trying to get cash to pay their kids' school fees, which they have no way of doing except through hunting and exploiting resources. All of this is creating really tense relationships between communities and the NGO. Communities are starting to revolt against management, and like stoning pirogues and attacking the eco-guards who, who are basically the main management entity of the reserve, who go around making sure people aren't hunting illegal species. Um, they recently burned down a WCS base in one of the southernmost villages of the reserve and attacked a bunch of reserve, uh, WCS workers. Um, but when you are in the villages, it's under, easy to understand people's frustration. They've been promised development opportunities and just better living conditions for ages and ages by different various external organizations that have come in and said, oh, we'll give you this, we can do this for you. But it's never been realized because people working in the swamp, developing the swamp forest, is just too hard. So increasing resentment attacks. Tyriel and I, sorry, I'm almost done here. Tyriel and I uh, went into Brazzaville, the capital, and looked into our colonial archive, archival records, 
and saw basically the same things were happening for colonial managers in this region. They, there's all these documents describing disorder, sorcery, looting, arson, and managers basically throwing their hands in there saying, please send me bullets because I don't really know what else to do with these people. They keep attacking and then running into the forest where we can't follow. This is just a funny one. It's an accusation of a man be eating people cannibalism, and the man says, yes, I did eat man because some my friends told me it was a chimpanzee in the pot, and I thought it was good to eat. A little tangential, but still. Basically, the crux of this is that these problems are age-old, and current management is kind of reinforcing these unequal power distributions that have been going on since way before <laughs> conservation interests were in the area. Um, I don't really have time to go into depth about this, but this is just to say that conservation is a, a, you can't say conservation without thinking of deforestation and all these terms that are, t are kind of crisis narratives about forests being lost, these species being lost, extinction, etc. This map likes to be thrown out about Borneo. It shows Borneo fully forested in the 1950s and then projects the rates of deforestation into the future. And these are pretty much what we see today. They do, they do track. And a lot of this clearing of forests has been for agricultural uh, palm oil developments and uh, logging, small-scale logging. But when we zoom in, it's really a story about wetlands because these forests are peat forests. And when you burn or develop or drain peat forests, they burn. All that organic matter dries out, the hydrological cycles of the forest are destroyed, the ecological processes disintegrate, and all that organic matter that was stored in the soil starts burning when it gets to be the dry season. And you can't put out a peat fire because once you put it out on the surface, it just burns down deeper into the peat and comes up in another place. So Indonesia has had some of the highest rates of carbon emissions in the world from the peat fires, catastrophic peat fires they've had. And this has also directly impacted the study area I was working in. So this is an orangutan at Tuanan in 2015. And this is the edge of the study area where I was working where I would go off, follow orangutans to the edge and they would have to stop because in 2015 this whole area was burned and is now not long, no longer forest. So it's really pushing these already small populations into even smaller areas. So we need to value wetlands more. If you look at any wetland in the world, the story is the same. People look at it and think, ew, wetlands, not valuable, let's develop them. And um, this leads to huge catastrophic ecological consequences and then billion dollar restorations plans that often fail. A classic example is the Florida Everglades, currently under a $10.5 billion restoration scheme, and really any wetland in the world pretty much has the same story. Not yet in Congo. In Congo, the conservation context is different. The narrative is all centered around local people unsustainably hunting wild animals for bushmeat, for food. But really, when we look closely at it, what's driving this this process. It's not local people hunting for subsistence practices like the people in the villages where I work who are being monitored by paramilitary conservation entities. It's, it's extra local, national, and even international markets that are demanding this bushmeat and selling and buying it from local communities. Um, so really the onus is on bigger scale economic markets and we really need to look closely at that and think more about who we're blaming for what kinds of environmental degradation. Already, like I said, these people, their lives are circumscribed by, circumscribed by being in a wetland. There's so, only so much the impact they can have on a seasonally flooded landscape. And increasingly, their already almost impossible lives are becoming more impossible because climate change is shifting all the processes that they've learned to adapt to. So the year I was there, the floods came early and lasted for twice as long as they should have. And this destroyed fishing cycles, it destroyed people's, everyone was wet and got sick more often, like all these things, and they can't adapt quickly enough to, to survive, really. People are, it's, it's pretty bad. So just think critically about these narratives that we tell ourselves about conservation and who, who and what is causing these, these crises that we are all concerned about. And so finally, the last thing I'm going to say is leave you with a primate-focused example. Um, the global pet trade of illegal and threatened species is emerging as one of the primary drivers of species decline, especially for furry, iconic, exotic species like primates or tigers or other things that are, people think are cool. 
And where is that demand coming from? Oh, here's a slow loris. This is a primate. Um, he was in captivity in a market in Indonesia. These guys are nocturnal primates, so they're really easy to go into the forest at night. You find their glowing eyes. You rip them off a tree. Hunter, or people, the pet trade people, rip them off the trees and then can amass tons of them. And they have almost no natural defenses except for poisonous incisors, which the people then rip out and sell. And I didn't put it in this picture, but if you go on YouTube, you can find pic videos of tickling slow horses, and they have this fear reaction that looks like they're smiling and laughing when they're being tickled. Um, and people think it's so cute. And they're one of the most trafficked primate species. This is all come, the demand is coming from, from North America, and it's being fueled by social media and internet based sales. And this is happening for great apes, it's happening for a lot of other species. And it's something we can easily address if people were just more aware of it and putting more pressure on these markets and thinking critically about when they see a picture of someone with a monkey on their shoulder, like, that's not good. <laughs> we don't want to promote people thinking these are cute, cuddly animals. Um, we, so, yeah, like I said, it's happening for all sorts of animals, including non-primates, and it's something we can easily address. And that's the end of my talk. Sorry for running over. Thank you. Um, please ask me any questions you want. If you visit my website, it's currently a work in progress, but it's, going, it's getting there. Any questions? Well, I have a funny question that I didn't expect to ask, but <laughs> basically, would you, would you say the villagers, like, as they are being left alone, are um, in general? When they're left alone? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they are well adapted to the life they lead. They've been living this way and are, you know, they have enough resources for the moment. They've been living and thriving in these swamp forests for a long time. Really the, but they're not really happy, but that's mostly because so many people have come in and said, we'll give you tourism, which will give you money, which will be able to pay your school fees, which will be able to do X, Y, and Z, and made all these promises that were never able to be realized because of the poor governance structure and lack of funding for development in conservation contexts. So they really, they're very frustrated, and they, and they want more, and they don't have any way of engaging with market, like um, economic markets because they have no way of making money. During your time in Indonesia, what was the language uh, spoken? Was it Bahasa? Yeah, it was Bahasa. It was Bahasa, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I learned that conversationally just because no one spoke English, so I had to learn it pretty, pretty quick. But now when I try and speak Indonesian, most of it comes out in French. And if I were to go back to Indonesia, I'm sure it would have its the flipped effect. I can only hold one language in my head at a time. But it was really great to learn. It's a, it's a very interesting language. Um, do you, do, you, do you speak Bahasa? Hmm? Do you speak in Bahasa? I studied it for two years at uh, Southeast Asia Studies uh, at Yale. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I never used it. <laughs> well, you're going to have to go then. <laughs> People are still speaking it. Yeah, it's a cool language. Sorry, I realize now that I was not really talking into this. Any other questions? Yeah. Is it a scary or intimidating experience? Like, what was your experience with like, going into these totally unfamiliar environments with people that you didn't necessarily know and culture that you weren't quite sure about? Yeah, in retrospect, I should have maybe been more, well, I shouldn't have been worried, but, it, it, but I wasn't worried at all in the moment. I, I was pretty excited to go. And then once I'd done that in Indonesia, I felt prepared also to do the same even more independently in Congo. Um, there is something to be said for like Western individuals just flying into these kinds of other cultural contexts that they have no idea about. I obviously, like, I do my best to learn. In Congo, I tried my best to learn as much of the local language as I could um, and, you know, really interact mostly with local people and do very site, place-based research that wasn't just armchair research where I was coming in, extracting information, and then leaving. I've spent a lot of time there at this point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, there, there's a lot of critiques of it, and I'm all for those critiques. I think we need to be more 
considerate of how we as Western and privileged researchers go into these um, global south southern uh, contexts and work do research. So I was I was not afraid. I might I should, maybe should have been a little more afraid. But it I I've, I've had some crazy experiences. Uh, but most of them have not been in the forest. I was hit by a taxi the first time I went to Congo, but that was in a city right after I left the forest. Um, so really, honestly, I'm more afraid of like <laughs> the cities than I am of going into these forests. So. And when I'm with local people, usually they, as long as I stick with them and do what they do, I can be pretty confident that they know what they're doing and I'll be okay. I was in Indonesia in 85 and 86 on uh, the island of Sumatra, mm -hmm. and uh, it was many, many years ago, but the project of preserving orangutans was very well developed yeah. in the Loiser National Park. Yeah. So I visited whenever I had the weekends from Medan to that station, and it was amazing what was done. First of all, they were taking the orangutans who grew up there, and the families didn't want to be the orangutan at all, so they would just throw them out. And then this station would somehow get to them yeah. and retain them how to live in the jungle, because they didn't know how to find food. So they had high up in the mountain stations, and the bee would go there and sit for hours and wait for events to happen. And it was unbelievable seeing um, rangers sitting there with bananas and milk. Yeah. And then orangutans were up there from the trees would start coming down. And they would come, and they would get a cup of milk, and they would drink like any kid mm -hmm. can imagine. And they would get one banana, mm -hmm. it and eat it. And they would want more, but they would give them more. They would tell them, go, go away, find food. So that was giving just the, the basic existence of calories and the rest that they had to learn how to find themselves. But uh, I will never forget these moments because some of them come to you and look at you with those brown eyes mm -hmm. yeah. and you just melt. And they want something from you. Yeah. And I didn't have anything. It's rain, it's wet, you sit in the mud, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I gave it to one orangutan, and orangutan looked at it, turned it, you know, I, I, I fell in love. I mean, I wanted to take him home, but... <laughs> no, you know, it's hard not to feel it, that way. But then another situation I saw in the station, one orangutan was taken for a walk with rangers, and I asked, why isn't that one sent to the woods? You know? learn how to live there. It turns out he had tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And they were treating him with all these new medications for tuberculosis. And they say that very often that is the case when they come from the big cities and neglect and so forth. That's one of the reasons why primates specifically are really bad for the pet trade. Um, bad for them and bad for us as well because being so closely related, there's a lot of pathogens that we can transmit to each other, including TB and other very debilitating polio. A lot, um, and so when when great apes are in contact with humans, often they can never. Not only do they uh, do they seek out human attention after that, um, and it's really hard to get them back to a wild state, but they also often contract a lot of human and debilitating and deadly diseases. And we can also get a lot from them, so it's really bad to be in close contact with non-human clients. But at that time, the cruelty is committed to these baby orangutans or whatever. It was fashionable to have ashtray made out of the pole. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them were disfigured because of that yeah. bad. Uh, I mean, you know, the humans are pretty. Well, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the same for so many species, and it still goes on. Um, but again, like, then we, this is kind of my whole point, is the, forever the, the dialogue around those unsustainable and behaviors was to condemn local populations that live near them, 
they are typically the ones being hired to hunt animals um, and because they're close to them. But the demand is coming from wealthy, urban-based people yes. um, in the countries and in other countries. So it's, it's really it's kind of a misplaced narrative to be monitoring and being punitive of local and indigenous communities for these kinds of things. Yes? So along those lines, why does it seem like there's such reluctance to enact better laws, you know, making it illegal? I wish I knew. I, I, there's a huge push. Like it, uh, people aren't really. Um, people want to do it. There, there's a lot of people behind it, very emphatically saying we need to change this. Um, it's just that, with every, you know, five years, a new way to sub, um, subversively uh, use the internet to make these kinds of illicit trades gets better. There's more ways to get around law enforcement. Um, and it's just kind of a, an arms race, a never-ending battle of, of finding ways to identify who is doing the trafficking and how to stop them. Did you ever get sick with local illnesses? Yeah, <laughs> a lot. Uh, actually, how did you get treated? I, well, um, so a lot of the people, I bring a host, Yale forces me to bring a host of medicines with me. Um, that helps. Uh, Often I just wait it out. Often it's like stomach things like giardia and you don't know you have it until you're just like can't stand up and dehydrated and then you just kind of have to drink a lot and wait it out. Um, I had malaria, oh, but luckily <laughs> I got it when, well actually unluckily, in these places malaria is so common, everyone has it all the time and it's like the highest, it kills the most children of any, uh, it's the highest reason for child mortality in these places. But it's so common to talk to someone and be like, oh, how are you? Oh, I have malaria. And then mm -hmm. they have treatments available to them, and also a lot of local things that they know help help treat it, um, like bark uh, teas and stuff that I have used. Um, but I got it, and so I was kind of numb to it. I was like, oh, yeah, it's malaria. Like, I probably will get it at some point. And then I got it. I got it the week after I came back for a Christmas break in the U.S. I came out of Congo, and I was happy to be back, and then... <laughs> I woke up one morning and, again, couldn't stand up, like, uh, yeah, I was shivering, and I knew it was malaria, because it's pretty, you go from freezing cold to really burning hot in the course of five minutes, and it's very, you, you just feel like you're dying, but in a very specific way. Um, and I went to Yale Health, and I said, I have malaria, I was just in Congo, please help me. It took them seven hours in the ER for them to confirm that it was malaria. They're like, "Are you pregnant? Can we do a chest X-ray? I don't think you have malaria." And then once they confirmed that it was malaria, they didn't have the access to the medication, which I could have gotten in five minutes in Congo. So it actually was unfortunate that I got it in the U.S. Um, now I know to bring back the Congolese uh, treatment with me whenever I go. But yeah, I've, I've been sick a bunch. Um, it's pretty common. And you got malar malaria even though you were vaccinated. You can't be vaccinated against malaria because it's a blood-borne pathogen. Oh. I've been vaccinated against a lot of things like yellow fever, polio, rabies. But m malaria, there is no, oh. there's only post-infection treatments. Um, it's a parasite in your blood cells. Um, that you, and so you can take antibiotics that can kind of pre-prevent you from getting it, make you less likely to get it, but they're not 100%. Um, and also, I just hate taking antibiotics for years on end, so I just stopped taking them eventually. Yeah. And got malaria. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just curious, if I may, um, when you were working with the orangutan, um, did, do you think your presence created some sort of anxiety or stress for them? I know they were high up, but did they ever want to come down and sort of yeah, ins that's inspect you? and? That's um, often young ones did. They're very curious and they're not yet aware that they should just ignore us. So they come down, try and throw sticks at us or pee on us. Um, <laughs> it's the. It is highly. The be all end all goal of these kinds of research, this kind of research on wild animals, is that we do not have huge impact on the behavior of the populations of the animals, and so we try and. Even for chimp research, like what my advisor does, or when, when anyone's doing this kind of following-based study, you have to, there's a certain distance you have to maintain. If the individual approaches you and is curious, you have to move back. 
and we, we never interact, we never are in physical contact. If, if an orangutan is showing too much interest in an observer, we stop following them for months oh. until, and we'll try again later and see if they kind of just start to ignore us. Oh, um, but there is cases of over-habituation where an individual, maybe in youth, gets used to interacting with observers and someone didn't follow the rules very well, and at the, after that, you can't follow them because they will always try and initiate contact with you. Um, there was an orangutan like that in our study site that we couldn't follow. So yeah, but the goal is not to interact with them in any way. Well, we are into 5.20, so you've all stayed here quite a long time. Thank you so much for coming.